Hello, folks. Welcome to Business Spotlight. You know, finding new customers is the lifeblood of any business. But do you know what? It's something that I find most business owners that I speak to, uh, they find it incredibly challenging. My guest today has built a fantastic business out of outsourcing exactly that service. I'm delighted to welcome my guest, Gavin Page, the founder of Accelerate 360. Gavin, it's great to see you. Thank you for joining. Morning, Mark. Thanks for having me. Uh, you're welcome. Thanks for coming on. Let's dive straight in. It's a brilliant story. I can't wait for you to tell this story. Why don't you share with the viewers how you came about starting your own business? The, the basic line is I, I climbed the greasy pole and when you get to the top, it's still greasy. So I thought I'd better have a go at doing this myself, to be honest. We identified that it's really hard building sales teams and getting the right people in, um, getting those people to perform well for you. And, you know, having um, worked all my career in, in sales leadership and doing that, I felt there was a, a, an opportunity to bring some of those skills to bear in a wider context than just the company I was working for. And that was really the ethos of the business. You've built a fantastic organization and it's a significant organization now and you've got an amazing client portfolio. But if you can cast your mind back all the way to the beginning, Gavin, what were some of the challenges that you faced when you started the business and, and how did you overcome them? I think the biggest thing that I, I, I looked at was I, I set myself some really clear objectives and goals. So I decided that if my business was going to be successful, I had to be at a certain point in a certain place at a certain time. If I'd have missed that, if it was a revenue goal, if I'd have missed it by a pound, I wasn't going to back down from saying this isn't working. So I set those goals realistically, but I also set them to a point where I could say, and I would really be able to analyze if I didn't get that goal, I had to have a really, really good justification for it. Not just a rose colored spectacle. I'm still loving what I'm doing, but really genuine steps, achieve, move on and, and set the next set of goals from there. And I think that was the, the big difference. And, and to be honest, they, they say a lot of businesses, you know, most businesses fail in the first year or two years. And I think that was the one thing that really helped me through that first two, two years was to, to have that really clear set of objectives. You're all about building strong customer bases for your clients. Mm. Why don't you share with us, though, how you went about building your own strong customer base in the first place? The last time we spoke, I talked about eating my own dog food. Um, so we, we, we do <laughs> practice what we preach. My father once said to me, only do, don't, if you're a salesman, don't become a hotel owner. Um, mm. You know, if you're going to set up a business, do what you do. So I, I set up a sales business and, and my contacts and referral network were really beneficial at that point. But to be honest, it was very much about applying a regimented structured approach to market. I can't suddenly build a brand overnight. What I have to do is go and find people by, by graft and activity levels. And I need to measure those and I need to be able to gauge them and I need to see which bits are working and I need to diet, train, turn the dials accordingly. So everything mm -hmm. we did at the very beginning was very, very sort of reported and very heavily measured in order to be able to know what was working. And that was the key, I think. And it's something actually I see so often as well. You must see it all the time, Gavin, you know, especially new businesses, they don't have that structured approach to selling. They kind of take a hit and miss, hit and miss approach. Right? But you very much advocate taking a structured approach. I do. And I think it's really hard for entrepreneurs as well, because naturally an entrepreneur has flair. They have, you know, they're, they're, they're not, regimented routine people often i mean in technology sometimes you could argue differently but but in reality i think if you're not if this doesn't come naturally to you make it natural to you i think is, mm. is, is the message you need to have that ability to to fly a little um to 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 sort of do the innovate and do different things but at the same time you've got to have a baseline that grounds you and brings you back to a reference point of success what does success mm. look and I think without that, you, you know, that that that's a real challenge for anybody. So we've got two aspects there. We're, we're talking a little bit about, you know, kind of establishing the discipline of some. But at the same time, how do you foster that culture of innovation and creativity within the business? Well, I suppose I've just answered that question to an extent just there. I mean, I think the fact that we have that sort of process led approach, but then what we try and do is encourage everybody to look outside the box. I have a half an hour in my diary, which is my innovation half hour. Um, mm. And, you know, I, I, I sit there and I'll do a bit of research on, you know, what is chat GPT and how is it going to impact me? And if I don't understand how it's going to impact me, 
what can I find out about it? And then perhaps share that in one of our management team meetings. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll have a, a sec session at the end of every every weekly management team we have where people can bring new ideas to the table. We so. do try and encourage that. Um, you know, part of our vision and values as well is in, encouraging that kind of innovation, even from the team and, and right the way down. I don't care whether it's, you know, the importance of having a cleaner who comes up with a great idea to, to uh, you know, a managing director who comes up with a great idea. That's irrelevant as long as the idea is good and people have got a chance to get that heard. What was that great quote from uh, Kennedy when he went to uh, NASA and there was a janitor there and he said, what's your role? And he said, uh, sir, I'm here to help put a man on the moon, right? <laughs> That's really so fair. I mean, it's it's very true. What about your journey? It's been a fantastic success story. If you kind of cast your mind back, has there been a pivotal moment or a decision that you took that significantly impacted on the growth of the business? I think one of the big changes we made was moving. I mean, the business originally started with an outsourced salesperson and me managing that salesperson. Um, for a, a small amount of time per month. So it was kind of what everybody now calls a fractional CRO model, but providing the salesperson as well. But that was typically done on a, a, on a contract basis uh, between us and them. I think the pivotal moment for us was as that developed and grew in popularity, people asked us additional services and we started to layer in those extra services. And we moved out of a consultancy and my time paid model and my business partner, Chris's time paid model, into we recruited a team and we started to develop that out. And that was the real pivotal change for us because rather than being having the value of the business in us, the value of the business became the people that were in it themselves. And we had to put in a management team at that point and we had to develop through. And it, it transitioned from that moment where... You know, every day I work for £100, I make £100 if I've got no cost. Mm -hmm. Having to move into that model where suddenly my cost is there, I'm only making £20 out of £100, I've got to have much more business. That was a transitional moment because then you have to build the engine that A, manages what you've got, but B, develops the future for you as well. One of the reasons why a lot of business owners shy away from selling is that they can't cope with the rejection. You've clearly overcome that, right? Because you're a great sales guy. How do you handle failure? How do you handle setbacks? And what lessons have you learned from it? It's a really good question. And I, I, would, I would not say that I am a rhinoceros-skinned ogre by any stretch of the imagination. I hate rejection. If you know about disc profiling, I'm quite high D, high I. Um, as a result of that, I like, I like not to be rejected. But... Uh, I think, you know, in terms of thinking about how you handle it, I think you've got to realise the fact that 80%, 70% of the time you are going to be rejected. By the time you go through that model of saying, if I contact 100 people, I'm going to end up meeting 10 or 15 of them. I'm going to end up with half of them in my sales cycle and maybe a third of them closing. You're down to sort of, you know, 2 3%. So you, your rejection is, is part of the whole sales process really and it's part of running a business not everybody is going to love your baby and as a result of that I think you have to be realistic about what can be achieved and how to achieve it but still have that sense of really significant enthusiasm about what you do and I think if you maintain that enthusiasm and if you believe in what you're doing the rejection is is water off a duck's back at that point mm -hmm. and i knew the whole time that we had value to bring to customers if i was mm -hmm. able to articulate that correctly but somebody couldn't see that then is that something i've done wrong or is that something that that individual or that market that i'm selling to doesn't value my service and if you can answer those questions it helps you deal with why you got a no in the first place and every no I think you come back strong actually what you're talking about there is the analogy that that selling is a numbers game right and and every rejection is a step closer to an acceptance and if you can get your head around you know it, it for the three in every hundred dials is going to be a yes you just know that when you do a, when you do 100, three of them are going to be an acceptance. You just don't know which three, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and I mean, I, it, it's quite funny because I, I talked to a guy who used to sell cable TV years and years ago. And he said, if I go up to a block of flats and there's 100 flats in it, he said, I know I'm selling three in, in 100 for the sake of argument, whatever the numbers were. But he said, I might go to that 100 flats and not sell any, but I might sell six in the next block. 
So he said, it doesn't matter. I still have, I still average three, but I've got to walk into that next block of flats just as enthusiastic as I did in the first one. And I've never forgotten that really. Brilliant. That's a great analogy. Thanks for sharing that. Let's talk a little bit about you. You're a very busy guy, Gavin. You're running a large organization now and you've got a big team. How do you maintain a work-life balance as an entrepreneur and what strategies do you use to avoid burnout? We as a business are very, very into mental health support, mindfulness and so on. I've taken a lead actually from, from uh, the generations below me where, where, where there's a much bigger recognition of the importance of mindfulness. And so I do practice that on a regular basis, I try and take 10, 15 minutes every day. I mean, I work from home part of the time. And when I started the business, there was a lot of time from home. And it's really difficult then to sort of, you get out of bed, you're straight at your desk, you're at your desk and you go back to bed. There isn't that journey home. And, and with the hybrid model we've got since COVID, I think it's much harder for people to use that journey home to switch off. Um, mm. So I created my own. I'd, I'd go out for a walk in the morning before I actually sat down at my desk and did some work. And I'd finish at the end of the day and I'd, you know, go and walk around the garden or, or, or whatever it is to create that moment of exit. I mean, I do have to be on quite late in the evening because I have a lot of American clients, but I'm quite disciplined about what I answer. And I've taught myself to say, that's important to respond to, that's not, or that can wait. I teach a lot of my um, team to think in terms of and you'll know this this one. I, 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 I forget what, what the name of the methodology is, but it's the urgent, important, not urgent, not important mm. cross. Um, yeah, and I, that's, very, how it that's the one. Thank you very much. I'd forgotten the name of it. But yes, I, I found that very beneficial. <laughs> Brilliant, folks. If you want to find the Eisenhower Matrix, go and get a copy of Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It's in there. Gavin, you're all about generating growth for your clients and i know something that um the viewers will want to know because you've got a large frame of reference is what's working well in terms of generating leads and growth for your clients right now there's not really a short answer to that one i'll try and, i'll try and be succinct on it i believe and i think what we're seeing is that right now it's certainly in northern europe it's the toughest it's been in many many years to to engage people and get through the door you know there was a time when you, you, you know, LinkedIn was the great tool of the moment. Um, and mm. I think automation tools in LinkedIn have, have oversaturated that as a, as a mechanism. LinkedIn themselves have tightened up the algorithms in order to try and add value back into the platform, which means you can only make 20, 20 connections, you know, the usual thing. Overall, what we're doing at the moment, we're focusing very hard on multi-channel. We're trying to engage people via email, via LinkedIn and social mechanisms, and via um, telephone. We are personalizing almost everything. Even in a volume market, you can personalize the messages to quite a high degree. And the other thing I would say as well is that people really do underestimate the the data, they accept what they get when they get data. Now, what I mean by that is I run a lead generation company and we have a recruitment company that specializes in sales. I get recruitment companies phoning me to sell me people and I'm a lead generation company and mm -hmm. I've got a recruitment company. So they obviously haven't looked at my profile well enough to understand um, if I'm going to recruit people, I'm obviously doing it myself. Why would I use them? Now, as there is an argument to say they're an overflow, but in which case, that's the message. Now, interestingly, I got that. I can see you've got a recruitment company and you'll recruit. If you need additional resources or have a larger brief to fulfill, we'd love to, we'd love to be helpful. Now that, I actually took the call from that guy. And that's the difference, I think, is that you, can, you just need to, don't blanket everybody in the same thing. Technology includes service companies, product companies, SaaS, um, hardware. So don't assume that everybody in a technology bucket is mm. going to receive the same message in the same way. Really parse that data and really make that message relevant, whether it's by phone, email, or LinkedIn. In my opinion. So let's build on that then, because that's a really good example. We talked about personalization there. What, what role has um, building relationships played in in your entrepreneurial journey or what does the role of building relationships play in the success of uh, your clients i mean i think it's critical really uh, i mean we 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 benefit hugely from referrals 
And the lead generation market at one end of what we do, because we our services run from lead generation, well, sales consulting, lead generation inside sales, field sales. At that lead generation end, it's very, very competitive. You know, you get lots of emails. How do you set yourself apart in that? So whilst we can go out to market in that mass way, on one hand, we still get faster close rates mm -hmm. and longer deal life from customers that are referred to us from people that have used us before. Mm. So for me, maintaining good quality of service and making sure that every customer becomes a referral has mm. been critical. Mm. Maintaining contact with a network that I've had and grown over the last 20 years has been critical. But what's really interesting to watch is, for example, Liam, my sales director, and how he's built his own network over the last few years of being with us and, and, mm. and how that benefit comes in from him. So again, I think... You know, even at the early stages of your, your career, giving a good service, being a good person and delivering what people need builds a relationship that, that, that is lasting and valuable at any stage, really. You talked a little, a little bit a moment ago about the different technologies that you're using. How do you stay up to date in, you know, what is a fast moving technological landscape? Now? I think I mentioned earlier about the innovation piece and carving out time. And part of that is just researching what tech is coming out, what, what other people are doing and saying. Our operations team, um, you know, we, we carve out time for them to spend doing research and, and, and looking at, at what might be new, what might be up up and coming i think there's also a reality that SaaS is it, it, it was a wonderful thing when i was originally selling it and is a bugbear for salespeople today to a large degree in technology because SaaS allows you to to buy in a low cost ongoing basis but at the same time you're entering a term agreement so our clients their customers are often locked in and we're locked into certain of the, the technologies that we use. And I think you have to have an acceptance that there is a cost of change and there mm. is a and, and that you need to really look at if it is new, is it a shiny new bike or does it justify a cost of change? And at that point, you can then really make that change. But to be in that position in the first place, you've got to carve out the time from the team and for yourself to, to keep researching and stay on top of that new stuff. It's a tough economic environment out there, Gavin, but you've built a strong and resilient business that's continuing to thrive. What, what advice or words of wisdom would you give to other business owners or aspiring entrepreneurs right now? Handle rejection well. We talked about that at the beginning. Ask yourself the so what question. This is what I, you know, I talk about this quite a lot with our clients is, they say, oh, my unique selling point is this. My USP is ABC. And uh, and you kind of sit there and you go, mm, so what? You know, what difference does that really make to the client? And I mentioned just a moment ago that cost of change. If you've got a great product that is, I mean, a brilliant example. I was bidding for um, a piece of business. There was an incumbent supplier. We were scored I think 95 out of 110 in the RFP scoring. The mm. incumbent was around late 80s. Mm. And we were told we'd scored highest in that. And the sales guy that worked for me went, well, hey, yeah, we've won this, we've mm. won this. We lost it. Um, and part of it was the cost of change because yeah. actually the areas we scored highly on weren't the ones that they valued as mm. highly in terms of risk for change. And so as a result of that, we scored better, but we lost. Mm. So for me, I, I think right now, understand the criteria for people's decision, sell to those criteria and be really honest with yourself and spend the time on the deals that are worth, worth that can be won, not the deals that just look good. Gavin, it's been fantastic to have you on. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your story with us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Folks, if you'd like to come and share your story on Business Spotlight in the way that Gavin has just done, we'd love to hear from you. Just comment, apply below, and we'll be in touch and schedule an interview with you. Until next time, speak to you then. Bye now.